started then. Awesome. Okay. All right. So hi, everybody. My name is Emily Phillips, and I'm the youth librarian at the Grass Valley Library. Thank you so much for attending our webinar with Michael Genhart. Um, he's the author of the Pura Belpre Honor book, May Your Life Be Deliciosa. Michael Genhart is a clinical psychologist and picture book author based in San Francisco. May Your Life Be Delicioso was one of the five books for children ages zero to 18 recognized by the American Library Association's 2022 Pura Belpre Award. Ooh. Yay! <laughs> for outstanding illustrations that portray, affirm, and celebrate Latinx cultural experiences. This particular book features the work of Latinx illustrator and designer, Loris Laura. So we're featuring this story for our winter reading challenge, which runs from December 15th to January 15th, because we loved the sweet combination of traditions, the family holiday cooking and the oral storytelling. To find out more about Nevada County Library's read, winter reading challenge, please visit our website, nevadacountyca.gov forward slash library. And I'll drop that in the chat for you guys or stop by one of our libraries. Um, as a special treat, the library has made this picture book into an interactive story walk. So you can enjoy the story while you stroll following the map to find the next page of the story in shop windows around downtown Grass Valley. You can pick up a map between now and December 27th at the Grass Valley Library. So Michael Genhart's gonna present for about 45 minutes to an hour with time at the end of his presentation to answer some audience questions, which you can enter in the chat box and I will moderate that at the end. Um, and to my teacher friends out there, if you guys could please type into the chat how many of your students are in attendance today, that would be super helpful for me in gathering statistics. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna Make myself go away and I give you Michael Genhart. Was there a question? The chat is disabled. Oh, I will dis I will enable it one sec. Let me do that after I take away my video. Okay. Oh. Thank you guys. Yeah. Okay. Well, happy holidays, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to present May Your Life Be Deliciosa. I, I just adore this book and it gives me uh, a lot of joy to be able to share it with you. As um, Emily pointed out, I wrote the words to the story and uh, Lotus Loda is the illustrator who won a really beautiful award for illustrations and May Your Life Be Deliciosa is published by Cameron Kids. This is a story of an abuela, a grandmother, who teaches her nieta, her granddaughter, Rosie, how to make tamales. And it's also the story about, <clears throat> as she shows Rosie how to make tamales, every step along the way, she imparts a little wisdom about how to make a delicious life as well. So I'm gonna read the, the book to you in a little bit, but I wanted to give you some background first. Um, and the background includes just giving you a sense of what inspired me to become an author. Whenever someone wants to write stories or books, they sort of draw from their own personal experiences and different parts of who they are. So for example, I grew up in a multicultural family. This photograph here is a photograph of my mom when she was little next to her sister, Vithia, in front of her parents, mis abuelos. This is a photograph from Southern California. <clears throat> and this is a photograph of a very proud Mexican-American family. So I grew up around a lot of Mexican-American tradition and customs from music to food. So that's a big part of who I am. In a similar way, this photograph is a photograph of my father. He's holding the accordion, which he played as a kid and throughout my childhood. And he's standing next to his brother in front of their parents, <clears throat> uh, my grandparents, who were both born in Switzerland. So I also, they didn't live that too, too far from us, also 
grew up around a lot of tra Swiss traditions around uh, food and, and music and so forth too. So some of my stories I draw from um, my multicultural family. For example, look, one of the books that came out, uh, I guess a year or so ago is called Accordionly. Guess what that's about? Or guess who inspired that, right? My father who played the accordion. And this is the story of a little boy who brings the two cultures of his family together through music, through the music of the accordion with the help of his two grandfathers, Opa and Abuelo. <clears throat> and this story is coming out next year. Spanish is the language of my family. And this is also inspired by uh, my, my mother, and this is a story of a little boy who enters the National Spanish Spelling Bee, which is a real thing. And um, his grandmother helps him study the words. And as she's helping him study the words, she also tells him what it was like for her when she was a little girl. When she was a little girl, she was not allowed to speak Spanish in, in public school. And that was a real thing. And worse than that, those kids were, were shamed for, for their culture, for their language. And so this is a story of healing and the story of celebrating Spanish. And I, I look forward to sharing that with everyone next year when it comes out. Okay, another thing that inspired me uh, to become an author is this is me when I was in, I think, third or fourth grade. And I was a uh, quite a reader. I just love books. These are a few of my favorite books, everything that E.B. White wrote, like Charlotte's Web. And then the story of Ferdinand, I love because it was a story about just, you know, being yourself, you know, being unafraid to be yourself. So I love being around books and reading books as a little boy. And then I grew up, I went to college and graduate school. I became a psychologist. Along the way, I met John, um, my husband, and we've been together now for 37 years. And along the way, <clears throat> we had a baby. This is me holding Gabby here uh, a long time ago because Gabby is now 27 years old and is getting married next year. Yay. She is a... Uh, a fifth grade teacher up in Washington State. So we couldn't be more proud of her becoming a teacher. In any case, I show you these photographs because one of the things that inspired me to become an author is I love the time of her life when she was younger, where I got to read lots and lots of picture, picture books to her. It was a really beautiful time for us. And so when I write books now, it sort of brings me back to that time when she was little, because it was such a, um, a precious time for us. All right. Now I wanted to share a bit about what inspired me to write this particular book, May Your Life Be Deliciosa. One of the days of the year that was my most favorite as a little boy was the day before Christmas, Christmas Eve day because it was a day that, in keeping with Mexican-American tradition, we would have a tamalada. Now, how many of you have ever been to a tamalada? Maybe you host in your home. Uh, we would have the tamalada at my grandmother's home or my aunt's or my mom's kitchen, and everyone would gather, the, the women would gather, and a little boy. <clears throat> Uh, that would be me. And here's what would happen. We would make tamales. It was a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. So what I loved about the tamalada is that it drew family together. It was a tradition that we did every year and continue to do to this day. And um, in our kitchen, there was music playing and people would dance, but there was also a lot of storytelling because you're with each other all day long. You're around a table assembling tamales, and it, it was a time to pass on stories from one generation to the next. So, for example, my grandmother would share a lot of stories about uh, her youth 
and my mom and my aunt would do the same thing. And so as a little kid, we got to hear all these stories, right? And they're stories that are now in us that we now pass on to our um, our children and grandchildren. So it was a time for like oral history to uh, be passed on from one generation to the next. So I love the combination of family, tradition, and storytelling that came together <clears throat> on this uh, during this event. And it's the it, these are the things I hope that I was able to kind of pull together in this um, story. May your life be deliciosa. Look, all of us come from families. On the outside, they look different, right? Different cultures, different races, uh, different constellations of families, moms and dads, and two moms, two dads, grandparents who are raising their grandchildren, all kinds of families. And so they look different from the outside. But on the inside, there are so many similarities, right? Parents who love their kids, kids who love their parents. So what I hope to accomplish in my books really is this theme of things that link us together. What kinds of things do we have in common? Including traditions, right? Every family has traditions. And uh, again, they may look different and so forth, but traditions are... are are sort of the glue that can hold families together and they're they're celebratory and and fun so i guess what i'm saying is as we go through this book and and one thing i hope that you'll do is sort of think about the things in your family that are unique including traditions and also the stories that are told in your family not just stories that come from books but Start paying attention to the stories that your great grandparents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and parents are telling, because those are unique to your family. And at some point, you may want to share those stories with your children and grandchildren. Now, I want to share something even more personal with you. These are uh, photographs I'm about to show you of my grandmother and her sisters, my mom and her sister growing up, just to kind of dive a little deeper into the Mexican American culture uh, as I present this, this book to you and some of the influences. Uh, the song that you're about to hear is called Yo Soy uh, Mexico Americano. And it's performed by a local group here called Los Insontles, and it's the story of being a proud Mexican American. All right, so this this is my family. Por mi madre yo soy mexicano, por destino soy americano. Yo soy de la raza de oro. Yo soy México americano. Yo te comprendo el inglés, también te hablo en castellano. Yo soy de la raza de oro, yo soy México americano. De Tijuana, Nueva York Tus países son mi tierra Los defiendo con honor Dos idiomas y dos países Dos culturas tengo yo En mi suerte tengo orgullo Porque así lo manda Dios Madre, yo soy mexicano, por destino soy americano, yo soy de la raza de oro, yo soy México americano. Well, 
thank you for your patience and I hope you enjoyed seeing some on a more personal level pictures of my family. This is my grandmother, my aunt, my mom, the original tamale makers in my family. So <clears throat> I just wanted to share share that with you and uh, and uh, since the tamalada is also a central character in this story, I thought I'd just talk a bit about what that is. Again, many of you are already familiar with it, probably. It is a tamale making party, as I said before, where everyone gathers and everyone has a job to do. You um, start with the corn husks, right, in the corn masa dough, and you season them the meat, because that's what you're going to fill the tamales with. You spread the masa on the corn husk, and then you start to assemble. Everyone joins in. The recipes here are, are usually never written down. So one of the things you do is you pay close attention to how this works, how the older generation does it so that someday, you know, you'll be doing this in your kitchen. You steam them, and in the end, you have a delicious tamale, right? All right, so you'll see how this is featured in the story here in a little bit. <clears throat> okay, now I have a, a special surprise, I suppose, for you. I had a chance to have a conversation with the illustrator, Lotus Lora, who again, won the Puta Bel Pre honor. And so I, I taped the, the conversation. And so I wanna share, it's about 10 minutes long, uh, snippets of that conversation because I thought, especially for the students out there, that you would be interested in hearing more about how a book comes together. How do the words and the, the illustrations match up? How does the author and the illustrator work together in forming a book? So this is what you're about to hear, and there may be a few surprises. Uh, uh, in the conversation that you'll hear and any questions that you have about this process, I'm happy to answer in the end. So this is my conversation or parts of it with Lotus Lora. The author and the illustrator never meet. This is the first time, by the way, that Lotus and I have met. We've had conversations through email. But hey, Lotus, we've Hi. never, ever <laughs> met before, ever. No. So this is quite a thrill. So uh, I want to bring Lotus into the conversation now and ask her so you can hear uh, what, what, how does your process begin once you have received um, the story, right? How do you decide, for example, yes, this is a story I want to illustrate? Well, first of all, like I was, when I first got the manuscript, I just fell in love with the writing because like Michael, I, I grew up around this. I grew up with tamaladas, um, and just kind of making tamales as a family and just kind of just sharing moments and stories and just kind of just being around family and enjoying that, that part of life. <laughs> um, so when I first started this book, um, one of the first things I did was actually, um, try to figure out what abuela looks like. So I, you can, should we share the first image? Yeah. So, so let's start with. That was, that was one of the first kind of initial drawings I was kind of working on. So I wanted to kind of play around with what abuela looks like. And I, a lot of it is kind of reference to some of my abuelas and what I remember of them. I only saw my abuelas maybe a few times in my lifetime just because they were in Mexico and we would visit them um, maybe only a few times out of my whole young young life. <laughs> so um, I explored different looks and kind of the, the Mexican aprons. I love that because I feel like that's such a important part of the way um, the abuelas look and then just kind of, I love the just the facial wrinkles in the hair. It's just, so I was very much inspired by just everyday abuelas that look like mine. <laughs> and maybe mm -hmm. they look like some other kids' abuelas. How did you decide on the final look? Um, well, that one, that was actually, I had help from um, the art director, um, Melissa, and she kind of, she was like, I, we, we like the way 
this one, the one above looks um, top right. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we were, so they wanted to go with that look for Abuela. And then from there, just kind of, that's kind of sparked how the other characters looked. And so mm -hmm. I then kind of go through each spread. Let's see. Oh, these are some color studies I work on. So with, um, just to kind of get the feel of what colors I want to use, I kind of look at um, folk art, Mexican folk art, and kind of how some like certain colors work with one another and kind of blend, bring that into the story somehow. So it, the book is very colorful, as you can probably see. <laughs> um, and so but you kind of create a color palette. Yeah, we create a color palette, finding there's a lot of yellows, some blues. I, I just and to be honest, I just gravitate towards bright colors in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you see in you know Mexican American households too. So I think the color palette you chose was so spot on. I I immediately felt at home. Yeah, it's very, yeah. there's so much warmth in it. And just, mm -hmm. I love textiles and patterns and like embroidery. Yeah. Oh, this is how sometimes that, oh, well, for this book, um, I use my iPad to kind of sketch out scenes. So I would have the typography laid out and then kind of create an image surrounding the type and kind of fitting it in a way that makes sense for the scene. So okay. before doing it on an iPad, I would probably do it on paper. So most, some people do work on paper and kind of use transparent, um, like transparency paper to work on top of it. But I found that using the iPad as a tool has helped me in these days, just because it kind of helps speed some of the process up and copy and pasting. Maybe you can actually, because kids, I think would be very interested in, seeing um, this, I mean, I, I think about paper and, and pencils and paint and all that, and, and you're talking about this is a device that you can actually use and draw on the device as though you're drawing on paper. Is that right? Right. And it, yeah, and it's not the, I mean, obviously, I love drawing on paper, but for myself, this is a very valuable tool for myself. And I, if I didn't have this, I would probably be drawing on paper. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But it's kind of nice to have this technology to kind of piece pieces together because maybe you want to make somebody a little bit bigger. So you kind of stretch it out and just kind of play with the scale of some of the figures or some of the objects and move pieces around. But. So there are some definite advantages. I wonder if you can talk to kids about, again, how long this process takes, including uh, like I was saying earlier about writing a story, that you make lots and lots of mistakes along the way, but then, but then what you, what you do about them or what you do with them? Yeah. So the process it's pretty lengthy process on the illustrator side because the moment you get the text, you have maybe about two to three months, sometimes even less, to work out on sketches for a particular book, and. This is how I originally start a piece where it's just very stretchy pencil lines and it's kind of just, it's almost helping block in um, the idea and how, what you want the flow of the spread to look like. Mm -hmm. So this is the scene of um, one of the first scenes where they're gathered around the table and, mm -hmm. and, um, and then the blank space is where the words are going to go. Yeah. Correct. So that's a more revised version of that. And I think around this time is when I got the note to um, change the way Abuela looks. And that's when I explored um, the way she looked. And so we ended up changing her face and kind of and um, other little parts of it because I think we wanted more curvatures on the bodies and not too many angles. So that, that's some of the notes you might get on, in, in a particular mm -hmm. book, just kind of changing stylistic um, elements. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned earlier that the author and the illustrator usually never don't don't meet, and in some cases, well, don't meet, and certainly don't meet during the process of putting a book book together. But in some cases, like with this publisher, which is Cameron Kids, um, uh, we were able to communicate through the publisher um, and and through the editor. 
And so, for example, uh, Lotus would submit your work to the publisher, and then they then sent me her sketches nice. to, to look at, so I could comment on them. And um, and I and I did, and I was so so grateful, you know, because then it feels to me like a much more collaborative yeah. effort. Mm -hmm. Like you're really working as a team, um, you know. In my opinion, illustration is such a such an art form. So, as the author, I think you have to be really sensitive to that and making comments um, have to be sensitive. Like you wouldn't barge in and say, "Can you make that wall orange?" I I just like orange. <laughs> like you would never do that, right? Because you're like that is. Uh, like, you know, try telling someone what to do and that's never yeah. okay. And in any case, you, you make comments that are suggestions like, hey, what do you think about, um, you know, the, the little girl, you know, looking in this direction and, and not the other direction or, or whatever yeah. and, you, and have a reason for it. And anyway, that gets communicated through the publisher back to the illustrator. And then you kind of go back and forth. Is was that how it was on your end, Otis? Yeah, definitely. Like I, um, and I'm always, I'm always receptive towards um, notes. Like I, I kind of like okay, I could see why that is a, a good suggestion, and we try it. And if it works out, it works out, I, and I'm happy to do it. But yeah, like for instance, you talked about the the little girl looking back. I was like, oh, that's a nice little gesture. I kind of like that because mm -hmm. before she was looking towards the group and it kind of helps carry the image over to the other to, right. like, to notice the other stuff happening in the others in the scene right right so that was a nice little little suggestion mm -hmm. so this next one it has more detail yeah so this is, would probably be more of a rendered um final drawing for the piece before i take it into color mm -hmm. um and so you know, everything's color. more developed and like that um yeah and then this is the final image so it's, it's so crazy to see it <laughs> flash from pencil mm -hmm. to full color because mm -hmm. I, I genuinely try to stick pretty close to the pencil sketch and i mean i might tweak a few things here and there like oh i'm gonna shift this chair or maybe this looks better here because compositionally it just makes for a better picture but overall it looks very much like the pencil sketch that i present and when you add color are you using the same device that we saw earlier that you drew with? No, um, so that one is, I use that device more like a sketchbook, whereas like when it comes to final um, images, I use um, a Wacom tablet, which is a much larger um, machine that basically, it's like a tablet, it's like an oversized tablet basically. Um, and so I'm able to do a lot of the, um, the, colorizations of the images through Photoshop, which is um, another program that a lot of artists use to to take something to a, a final, I guess, if you want to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I could stare at these all day long. What would you say, I'm thinking of a, a question uh, uh, a boy asked me once when I was presenting a, a book to a, a classroom. He asked me, hey, um, how do you become an author? And I said to him, do you like stories? He said, yeah. I asked him, do you like to tell stories? He said, yeah. Then I asked him, well, do you have stories you would like to share with others? He said, uh-huh. You ever write them down? said no and I said well why don't you start writing them down because as soon as you start writing them down and sharing them with others you're an author and he said no way <laughs> anyway <laughs> my question to you is what would you say to someone a kid who is interested in drawing and and illustrating a story especially a kid who might say i don't know how to draw 
Oh, wow. I mean, I feel like you're very much like yourself. It's like you, you, you want to encourage kids to, to pick up a pencil and draw if you're, that's what they're into. If they, if you like creating an image, if you want to tell stories with an, a drawing and let, and share it with people and then keep doing it. And mm -hmm. you just, you practice as much as you can and it has to, it can be with the simplest tools as like just a pencil and a paper or a crayon anything that inspires you and you you draw and it was a pleasure to talk about the book this is my first mini interview um i hope it inspires other latinx children to or anybody to kind of write and draw and kind of be interested in the process of making books mm -hmm more uh, next kids doing stuff like this. I agree. I hope it inspires anyone who wants to pick up a pencil and write words down and tell stories or pick up a uh, colored pencils or a paintbrush and draw, maybe maybe even become a author illustrator. That's someone who does right. both, right? The words and the and the illustrations. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I did. Lotus, thank you so much for you. joining me and having this conversation. And I hope you enjoy May Your Life Be Deliciosa and any other book that you pick up. And I hope as you pick it up, this conversation comes to mind where you think about how did this book come together? Now you have a sense. Bye for now. Thank you very much. All right. I hope you enjoyed that mini conversation. I just thought it was kind of, I think it's cool to hear some of the inside story of how a book comes together. So I, I hope it piqued your interest as far as how it, how it works. Okay, now I'd love to read the book to you if you're all ready. Okay, if you remove the cover, this is what you see underneath, which is kind of cool, all these tamales. <clears throat> All right. Every year on Christmas Eve, my abuela Pina, mama, tia, sister, cousins, and I gather in abuela's kitchen to make tamales. Es una tamalada, a party in the kitchen. Music playing, feet dancing, voices singing, storytelling. It's also a lot of work. Everyone has a job to do. My sister Pancha and I soak and clean the corn husks in warm water, making sure to remove the silk threads. My cousins chop onions and garlic, trying not to tear up. My tia roasts the chiles. Mama prepares the corn masa dough, mixing it with lard and the roasted chiles. And abuela's in charge of cooking the meat, feeling with its secret seasonings. Where is the recipe, I ask. <laughs> Abuela laughs. It's in my heart, Rosie. I use mis ojos, my eyes to measure, mis manos, my hands to feel, mi boca, my mouth to taste. My Abuela gave it to me, and I am giving it to you. My favorite part is when Abuela tells us how to make a tamale. We already know how. We do it every year. It's Abuela's stories we love to hear again and again. When it's time, I shout, Abuela Pina, cuéntanos por favor. And so she begins. You start with una hoja, a corn husk. The warm water has made it softer and easier to work with. Abuela looks into my eyes and smiles. Rosie, mi nieta, may you always be flexible, flexible. One thing I want to point out is all the illustrations in black and white are the story of Abuela when she was a little girl. Abuela takes the husk the outer part of the tamale, and says, may you always have protection and security. Protección y seguridad. 
She applies the dough to the husk, not too thick and not too thin. She explains, <clears throat> the masa comes from corn. Like a corn stalk, may you always stand tall and proud. Pararte de guida y orgullosa. Then Abuela adds the meat filling with roasted chiles. May you always have food to eat and spice to make things special. Comida suficiente y bien condimentada. And then she adds an olive, placing it right at the heart of the tamale. May you have love and affection in your life always. Amor y cariño. Abuela carefully folds the tamale, bringing one side toward the center, then the other, before folding the bottom upward. May you have lots and lots of hugs. Muchos abrazos. She places the tamale in a large pot, one leaning upon the other. May you always have the support of family and community, familia y comunidad. Now it's my turn. With abuela's wishes in my heart, I take my place in the kitchen and shoulder to shoulder, we all make dozens and dozens of tamales. We soak the husk, warm and soft. We spread the masa and stand up tall. We add the meat and hear our stomachs growl. We hide the olive and dream of love. We fold them snug like abuela's hugs. I don't need a recipe. I use my eyes to measure, my hands to feel, my mouth to taste. And then we wait for the tamales to steam, their delicious scent filling the air. Abuela reminds us all, may you always have patience with yourself and others. Paciencia. We groan. A few hours feels like a lifetime. But then it's time to eat. We carefully unwrap the tamales one by one. Deliciosa! May your life be delicious, Abuela sings. <clears throat> Every Christmas Eve, we gather year after year after year. And now look, Rosie's a mama, and she's showing her son how to make tamales. And now I give to you what my abuela gave to me. You start with una hoja. And that's me, your lucky deliciosa. This is my mom when she was little, and that's me with my grandmother, my mom, all grown up. And this is Lotus and her grandmother and her brothers and sisters and cousins. So that's the story. I thought we would maybe have a little fun with Spanish. This may be super easy for a number of you, matching some of the Spanish words with English words, starting with a tamal. What's a tamal? It's what you eat, right? It's a tamale. And what's a tam tamalada? We just talked about a tamalada. Of course, it's a tamale making party. You start with an hoja. What's an hoja? What is that again? The corn husk. And the masa is the corn dough. Carne. What is carne? It's the meat, meat filling and familia. Familia, of course, is family. Tradición is tradition. Musica is music. Abuela is the grandmother. And of course, Deliciosa is delicious. All right, fun with Spanish. Now, I thought I would end with just a few words about writing. And, and I'm trying to speak to you as young writers. And my message here is anyone who's interested in writing a story, just start writing them down. Right. I would think we often worry about, is it perfect? Or what if I get the spelling wrong? Don't worry about it. All of that can come later. You know, this book <clears throat> took many, many drafts. Drafts is another word for a, a version of the story. There are probably 25 or 30 versions of the story before it ended with the book that I just read to you. So what I'm getting at is when you first write down a story, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, in my experience, the first version, the first draft is not very good. And that's okay. That's okay. It's supposed to not be very good because you're going to come back to it time and time again with help, you know, a teacher or a parent or one of your friends, and you're going to make it better, improve it bit by bit with every every draft. So don't worry about how it sounds or spells or the spelling. Just just write down the story you maybe maybe a story only you can tell, right? It's that special. And if you want to do the drawings, like like Lotus and I were talking about earlier, do the drawings as well. And don't worry about, oh, it doesn't look right. Those go through different drafts as well. One of the things that I think is super important to make a story, a story that we all kind of connect with, I call heartstrings, is choosing a story that comes from your heart, right? A super, the feelings are very strong within your heart. And if you can kind of put those feelings into your main character, like Rosie in this case, and, and the grandmother, and that gives a character heart that then reaches the reader's heart, right? The person who's holding the book can really feel those same feelings. I call it heartstrings because <clears throat> if you can connect your heart to the character's heart, to then the reader's heart, that is a very special, powerful story with some feeling behind it. It's a super important element to a, an effective story. Like anything you want to get better at, you practice. That applies to all of us. Whether you want to be a, a good reader or a soccer player or a musician or even a good friend, it takes lots of practice. And we just have to be okay with that. That's just an important part of the process. And um, I hope in, in ending today, this presentation and this story inspires all of you students to start listening to the stories in your family, from your parents and grandparents and so forth. And some of the stories may be very happy and joyful. Sometimes they're kind of sad or uh, stories of challenges, that's okay. It's a way of keeping the oral history of your fam family going by paying close attention to those stories. Like I said before, they become part of you and you can share with your kids and grandkids, passing them off from one generation to the next. So start listening more carefully to the stories in your family because every family has them. Muchas gracias, that's, that's it. I hope you enjoyed. Your life is deliciosa in this presentation, and now I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. Thank you, Michael. That was awesome. Um, this is Emily speaking. Uh, so I have some questions that I will read for the participants, if that's okay, and then give you time to answer them. Um, so is this a true story? <laughs> that came from Grass Valley Charter. It is absolutely a true story. I hope that uh, the photographs that I shared of my family and the Mexican American tradition um, showed that. And yeah, it's something that we do every single year and continue to do. And yeah, it, it's super true, super authentic, and more importantly, super, super fun. And it's especially fun to see now next generations joining and you know nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews because you can already see the future where someday this is going to end up in their kitchen and they want to know how old were you when you started making tamales i was a well i was a helper i was probably five five or six you know a little kid and you know, you can argue how helpful uh, a little kid is, but I certainly was part of the, the kitchen from a very young age. And, you know, you do the job that is doable for a young kid, and those jobs change as you get, get older. But yeah, I started really young because I just, I knew that it was a fun day because of <clears throat> everything that I shared with you, what was happening the music, the dancing, the, the storytelling, <clears throat> but also what came out of it, 
is super mm -hmm. yummy tamales. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yes, do you eat tamales all the time or only at Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, good question. Uh, it is not all, only at Christmas time I, because I love tamales, but the making of the tamales is a once a year tradition in our family <clears throat> because it's, it is a group effort and a lot of work. The other times a year that I eat tamales are you know, at a restaurant or something like that. We're very lucky <clears throat> here in Marin County and there's a very large Latinx community and uh, lots of opportunities to buy authentic tamales. So I, I partake year round. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they also wanted to know um, when and where does the story take place? When and where? Well, the when is, you know, Christmas Eve day, mm -hmm. Tamalada. Um, and where, look, I grew up in Southern California, um, but the where could be anywhere, mm -hmm. right? In, in anywhere, I mean, this is again, a, a Latinx, Mexican American tradition, the American Southwest, of course, as a very, or the United States as a whole, as a huge Latinx um, population now so the where is wherever there's a gathering of people who want to make the tamales mm -hmm. <laughs> in my case it's the it's southern california but again i hope this story inspires you to think about traditions of all kinds in your family depending on what your uh who makes up your family what cultures and so forth so um yeah i think as i mentioned before all families have different kinds of traditions this is a unique one in our family that just happened to take place in southern california but it could happen anywhere and so do you still make tamales every year oh yeah yeah right. every year yeah super super fun tradition mm -hmm. cool. and as i said super fun to see the next generations yeah partake and to watch them watch them watching how it's done and every year to see some of them step up and take on more of a role right because they're they're ready to and want to so it's it's really fun to see the tradition continuing with each each year yeah. well, here's a good one do you have any other family traditions i think we all do uh well, so for example, my um, I mentioned that earlier book, Accordionly, Abuela and Opa make music. My father played the accordion um, when I grew up, when I was growing up. When my grandparents would come visit from both sides of the family, they didn't speak each other's languages, Spanish on the one side and Swiss German on the other side. And so one tradition that happened every time they came together was my father would bring out his accordion and play music. And it instantly brought the family closer together because music, this universal language, <clears throat> just brought both sides of the family together because the accordion in this case is a super special instrument in both cultures that they instantly recognize. And so a favorite tradition in our family when the grandparents would come together was my father playing the accordion, mm -hmm. right? And it's really a beautiful point of connection yeah. or for the family that otherwise would have been, would have felt more disconnected because the language piece was missing, but music provided a kind of bridge. Yeah. So yeah, do you think that food provides a bridge? Absolutely. Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah, because people you know most people love eating but also love sharing right and so and if you're open and experimental and so forth uh to eating food from different cultures it absolutely is a wonderful bridge you're getting to know people who are different from you through food is i think an excellent kind of bridge and yummy. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Delicious. <laughs> so I have a few questions here about your writing process. And mm -hmm. then um, we'll, we'll see where we're at and we can keep going. Um, so when did you start writing? How old were you? I, well, I think all students write as students. So I was, I don't know, probably in first, second grade, you know, writing, but not not the kind of writing, like writing stories. Um, <clears throat> I tell you, one of the things that I used to do, which is maybe the subject of a, of a future book, actually, is because I loved reading and always wondered how books came together, I used to write letters to authors <laughs> and to illustrators and and just to ask them like oh tell me more about this story or whatever and many of them would write back cool uh, and so not that long ago i found some of those letters actually from the authors and the illustrators i i wrote to so yeah i wrote as kids do uh things like letters <laughs> to authors and illustrators from a young age yeah, but not, I didn't really start writing stories until later. And I didn't really start writing books. My first book came out in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, Ouch Moments. And so it hasn't been that long. It's six years. Yeah. Um, so I've been very fortunate as far as being able to write stories and, and get them published. But I... Yeah, I didn't start writing seriously until probably 2013 or 2014. And what made you want to become a writer then? Well, I, so my daughter left for college and um, I have a full-time practice as a psychologist and I knew I'd have more time on my hands. I used to volunteer at her schools throughout the years in the library, who knew? And, and I just thought, well, I'm going to have, again, more time on my hands. And I just love books. And I wanted to find something else creative to do. And as I mentioned before, writing picture books in particular brought me back to the time when Gabby was younger. And so I think her departure was a uh, impetus mm -hmm. for me to, to actually start putting uh pencil to paper <laughs> and by the way it took a long time as i mentioned this is it took a long time to learn the craft so i spent a number of years just going to workshops and conferences and just becoming a student learning mm -hmm. how it's done yeah yeah i spent most of the time those two or three years just listening listening a lot it's an important part of learning yeah um what do you think is the best thing about being an author I have to say, um, being able to share stories like I am today with all of you is probably my favorite thing, right? Because you get to tell a story that's important to you that's now in the form of a book that hopefully connects with kids. And if it's a story that inspires kids to tell, as I mentioned before, their stories, or um, it's a very important to me that I write books that where kids see themselves in the books because I think a lot of a lot of different kinds of kids are not super represented in books and so that's a big push for me I really want to write books for more and more kids to see themselves in the story on the pages you know that helps them feel more seen right wow that sounds like my family or that's my story or that reminds me of blah 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 that's my favorite part those reactions yeah um and let's see we're almost at time so can i ask just one more question oh yeah sure okay so in the story, Abuela shares her hopes, right? When she's discussing each step of the tamale making process. Um, for example, like she tells Rosie, may you always be flexible, 
when she's making softening the corn husks and may you always have lots and lots of hugs. Um, what kinds of hopes and aspirations do you have that you would like to share with the Nevada County community here? Oh my goodness, that's a great question. Uh, I guess my hope is that, again, stories like this inspire kids to dream, <laughs> to dream big, to dream about things like, um, how do I want to use my voice? How do I want to make a difference as I grow up? Because we all can, we all do. I want, I want who I am and what I have to say, what experiences I've had to make a difference, right? And so if we all do that <laughs> and uh, collectively see, wow, those differences can really help shape a better world, that's what I hope for right? Mm -hmm. Let these kinds of stories help you dream big and also see what kind of difference you can make. One person, right? And then you add up um, many people and you, now you have a collection of individuals making differences in their own unique ways. So I, I hope that, uh, that's what I hope for. Thank you, Michael. That's what I hope for too. Um, thank you for your beautiful story and for sharing your process and, and all of that background information on the book. That was super cool. And um, yeah. You're so, welcome. Thank you. Happy for holidays. Me. Are you wearing your apron? Are you going to go cooking? I'm wearing my tamale apron. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I meant to show that earlier. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So not quite ready for the tamalada, but uh, I'm sort of getting into the spirit of it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you again, Michael. And um, hope you enjoy your holidays. Everyone be safe. Stay warm. Thank okay. you. Take care. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.